thank you for being here. It's uh, my pleasure to be here today. My talk will be uh, about rare cells, uh, personalized medicine, and microelectronics, which you may wonder what has to do with this, but I will show you uh, in a few moments. Uh, personalized medicine is a very wide uh, uh, subject. Um, most of the things which I will tell you about uh, holds true for uh, many settings, uh, but uh, my main uh, focus today will be on uh, cancer. And uh, what is the problem with cancer? So I borrowed this slide from uh, Christoph Klein, the chair of experimental medicine at the University of Regensburg, uh, which is one of our collaborators. And uh, um, the issue is with cancer is that it's not um, a single disease, uh, so it is very difficult to treat. And uh, cancer drugs are actually remarkably unsuccessful uh, for this reason. So whereas they, prov did pr they do provide a benefit, when you measure it over a cohort of thousands of patients, you can uh, get a, a, ben a clinical benefit. It is clear that this model of uh, uh, one size fits all, a drug is given to every patient regardless of the uh, peculiar genetic makeup of the patient uh, will not be uh, sustainable. So the idea was then to develop, the, uh, to develop targeted therapies. So if you know the biological underpinning which drive the growth of the tumor, then you may be able to design a drug which eats the target and do give a clinical benefit which is significant and more uh, in time. However, one of the problems is that uh, the biology is not as easy as uh, uh, you may think uh, at the beginning. Although there were remarkable success in, and there are today a lot of drugs on the market which uh, exploit this uh, targeted therapy to uh, advance uh, the, the benefit to patients, then eventually many of the patients relapse because uh, the uh, evolutionary pressure which is given by uh, the drug targeting a certain target uh, will not take into the consideration uh, the other pathway, metabolic pathways and mechanism of resistance which uh, the uh, cancer cell eventually develop to escape uh, the therapy. And so uh, this gives uh, um, the idea that actually our target is not uh, uh, really there, it's the moving target. And so uh, you may risk of missing it if you don't take into consideration this. Um, this. And so what you need is not uh, just a picture of the biology, you need the entire movie. And actually, uh, although it's not clear today whether this is an evolution or these are resistance clones which were pre-existing in the tumor tissue, uh, you probably will need to have this movie in a full high definition because you may have missed it at the beginning to detect the cells which are the nasty cells, which may be rare in the initial tumor population. So with this, uh, with, um, there is a, uh, an increasing um, emphasis on looking uh, at the biology of the tumor at the individual cell level. And uh, the NIH uh, invested, uh, allocated more than $90 million recently uh, because it's clear as uh, Francis Collins, uh, another TED fellow, um, put forward that it is crucial to our understanding of the disease to go for single cell and understand from there. So uh, in cancer, we have here a, a very good opportunity uh, which is linked to the presence of circulating tumor cells. Uh, it has been already uh, made very clear that uh, uh, there are the circulating tumor cells in the blood of cancer, metastatic cancer patients in several settings, uh, breast, uh, colorectal, and prostate cancer. Uh, this kind of uh, um, uh, link has been validated also by the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, and in th all the studies, it has been made clear that this is a very important uh, uh, prognostic indicator. Unfortunately, um, this doesn't tell how to bet treat uh, uh, the patient, only predict survival. Whereas what we want to do is to get hold of those CTCs and uh, characterize them at the molecular level in order to uh, choose the right therapy to address to the right patients. So uh, for this, um, uh, we have to take into account uh, the numbers. 
So if you take 10 ml of blood, uh, you will find uh, some 50 billions of erythrocytes, some uh, 50 millions of white blood cells, and uh, as you have seen before, uh, in this amount of blood, having more or less than five circulating tumor cells already spells the difference between a, a poor or a, uh, or a better prognosis. So the numbers here are very challenging. And uh, so this leads to a um, problem due to the purity uh, gap which you have. There are today technologies which are uh, quite efficient, do an amazing job. Uh, it's relatively easy to get rid of red blood cells. And there are techniques also which uh, allow you to pick up um, the putative uh, uh, nasty cells, recognizing uh, surface antigens which you can target with antibodies and pull out with a magnet, or exploiting uh, other physical differences like size. Tumor cells are pretty uh, larger, typically larger than uh, white blood cells. But still, with these numbers, uh, after this enrichment, you end up uh, with the uh, uh, thousands of contaminants of normal cells. And this kind of purity falls short of delivering uh, uh, the purity which is needed today by uh, most uh, of uh, the genetic uh, uh, equipment to extract the molecular information from the circulating tumor cells. So, um, about 10 years ago, when uh, uh, we started up Silicon Biosystems, I was an electronic engineer working and uh, in designing uh, integrated circuits. And we noticed that uh, uh, already at that time in, in 2000, uh, it was possible to integrate in microchips, uh, transistors and electrical circuits uh, uh, with some micron resolution. So uh, quite well uh, comparable, or you could uh, embed uh, a lot of intelligence, uh, memory, transistor switches, uh, in a, an area on a chip which is comparable to the size of a cell. So we set out uh, uh, with this idea, and uh, th you see here a picture of, of uh, Gianni Medoro, one of uh, my colleague and co-founder of Silicon Biosystems. So he came up with this idea to, um, uh, to create uh, a possible cage on a microchip, exploiting the fact that, that we can integrate into an array of electrodes uh, uh, in the digital circuit like uh, um, with a microelectronic substance like you have in your cell phone, uh, an array of electrodes, and just placing on the lid a counter electrode, uh, we were uh, able to create these field cages, energizing the electrodes and the lid uh, with in phase and counter phase AC voltages. As you can see from this computer simulation, we can create uh, uh, field minima. Uh, so um, these are areas where the cells which are suspended in the liquid uh, get pushed by the dielectrophoretic force. What you see here is a, a, is a computer simulation of this uh, electric field, and the cell, so that get, uh, they get trapped in stable levitation without contact with the surface suspended in the liquid. And now we have uh, uh, an easy way to manage them because just reprogramming the pattern of voltages applied to the electrodes, we can shift the field minima, and drag along the trapped particles. And this is key because uh, now we have a way to digitally control, in a deterministic way, all the particles on the chip. And uh, this can scale very well because uh, with the microelectronics, we can design a chip, uh, uh, I have a pic, you see here a picture, a, a chip like this one, and in this small area, which you see here, we can embed uh, over 300,000 electrodes, which are 20 micron in pitch, so comparable in size to uh, a mammalian cell. And, uh, and, and uh, the structure here, this array, is uh, arranged, as you can see here in the, in, uh, in the slide. Uh, we define a, a main chamber, uh, a parking chamber, and recovery chamber by spacer integrated into the system. So all the floor is tiled with electrodes. Here, they are not to scale because they would be invisible, of course. And when we inject uh, uh, the sample, all the cells spread randomly, get trapped into the nearest cage, and uh, uh, are kept in stable levitation. In the machine, there is an embedded instrument, an, an, an optical microscope, which scans the surface of the chip. And then you can see, uh, recognize the cells of interest by um, fluorescent antibodies and technologies which are available off the shelf and have been developed uh, um, for, for 
recognizing these cells. So now the machine knows which cell you want to move. It brings them automatically to the parking chamber, crossing the gate. And the good news here is, is that since uh, they are so rare, you don't have parking problems once in a while. So, uh, and from there, you can take them one by one, bring them into the recovery chamber, flush them out, uh, pushing with some liquid, and deliver them one by one, 100% 1 pure, or in small groups as you like, and also taking negative controls. And so you can go for single cells. So this is a, a small movie which shows uh, uh, the, the real thing. So the chip after loading with the sample and the buffer is inserted in the machine. Uh, it gets uh, into the machine, gets calibrated, and automatically the instruments start to scan with up to six channels in bright field and up to uh, five uh, fluorescent channels, which are used to detect positive markers and negative markers across all the cells which are detected on the chip across all these wavelengths, so we have a clear picture of whatever is available uh, on the chip. And so, at the end of this process, uh, the machines make available a set of data, uh, like the scatter plot, where you, uh, you may have uh, uh, the, um, uh, the tumor cell, the putative tumor cell, which are positive for the tumor marker, and you can single them out and get uh, rid of the contaminating leukocytes, which, is, uh, which are here indicated, uh, which do not have the tumor marker. So this uh, zoom in into a um, um, uh, hand of events which may be tumor cells, but this is not enough. You need to look at the images, and the images allow you to discriminate uh, the real tumor cell event from the false positive and the false negative, and so you have a reliable selection, and then the instrument takes care of doing the rest. So start to move the cages which uh, contain the cells of interest. All the other cells stay trapped in their initial position. This is a microscope uh, view, uh, a real-time footage from the, from the chip. Actually, you don't have to look at it because the system knows where everybody is and manages the traffic like a, a sort of a, uh, air control. So all the cells go through the gate and uh, uh, orderly end up into the parking chamber, leaving the area contaminated by other unwanted cells and ending up, ending up uh, there, uh, each one with its own I unique identifier. And at this point, it's easy to, uh, for example, you see here, taking one cell, cell number 284 is selected for single cell recovery and gets displaced into the recovery chamber. And when it gets there, uh, the system activates a flash of liquid, a small droplet, builds from the backside of the chip, and just by gravity falls down into the recovery vessel, delivering the cell to the test tube, which you will then use to go for further testing. So this, uh, this process makes it uh, automated and reliable, which is key in order to bring it to the clinical practice, because of course it's not, um, it's not thinkable to uh, to have someone uh, uh, doing a micro manipulation or any kind of uh, this complicated stuff if we want to bring this to the real use in patients. And so this is also in line and um, uh, makes possible to build a pi an analytical pipeline which uh, 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 builds on the capability of uh, isolating single cells. Uh, and when you have single cells, you don't have to worry about the thousands of contaminants which uh, would overwhelm your signal from mutations uh, and copy number variations, which are indicative of uh, the efficacy of a certain therapy and the, so the information you want to extract. If you have a 100% pure cell, you can use uh, a technique like whole genome amplification, which uh, from a single cell can amplify the DNA and uh, multiply it uh, millions of times so that you can tap into the power of uh, analytical techniques like the next generation sequencing machines, which are uh, being uh, uh, made available today and uh, which allow you to uh, cheaply uh, investigate the DNA of the cells or the RNA and get the data you need in order to, uh, first of all, understand the biology uh, and uh, in order to bring this into CTC analysis into a routine clinical practice. Because this, of course, will need uh, some time to uh, pass through clinical validations but uh, uh, we have here a technology that uh, uh, can do this, 
actually the machine is already labeled as a CEIVD because this is the direction we want to go. Uh, today, the machine is being used uh, in, in uh, clinical uh, research uh, uh, in oncology and uh, to understand the biology, to select patients in clinical trial, and eventually this will lead uh, uh, to the possibility to associate the information from the genetic uh, um, characterization of the cells to the efficacy of drugs which are tested in clinical trials and to also use it for the many drugs which are already available today and, we and, we ha and which have associated a profile of efficacy or inefficacy in order to uh, bring to the routine therapy management of the patients uh, with an informed decision. With this, I, I thank you for your attention and uh,